Good morning, brothers and sisters, as we return to our study in Numbers 22. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his wisdom so that we may more clearly understand all that we are to know that is to prepare us for the work that is yet to be done? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the examples of those that have gone before us. We thank you that we may learn from you, even at this time in earth's history. Help us, Father, that our minds may be open. May your spirit be sent. May your spirit be upon us. May our conversation lift you up lift up your character so that we may more clearly understand that which is yet to be done by you through us in this world and this history. May your angels surround us. May our minds be open to your guidance so that as we examine this example, we may more clearly see that which we are yet to do and what we are yet to avoid. Be with us, each one that are attending this meeting. Help us now. Direct us and guide us. For this, Father, we thank you. And in this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now we're going to address just a little bit of a recap as we progress to finish off Judge or Numbers 22. Now, and God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call on thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that thou shalt do. And as scripture says, and Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. <coughs> the scripture does not give us the picture that Mrs. White does. As Sister White says, we are living in the last days. Evil prevails on every hand. The removal of one safeguard from the conscience, the failure to practice one good resolution, the cherishing of one evil habit, one neglect of the high claims of duty, breaks down the defenses of the soul and opens the way for Satan to come in and lead us astray at his pleasure. The only safe course is to let our prayers go forth daily from sincere hearts, as did David. Hold up my goings in thy paths, O God, that my foot steps slip not. Balaam had received permission to go with the messengers from Moab if they came in the morning to call on him. But annoyed at his delay and expecting another refusal, they set out on their homeward journey without further consultation with him. He was now freed from their solicitations and every excuse for complying with the request of Balak had been removed. He could not, however, bring himself to relinquish the honors upon which his heart was set. And since the Lord had not a second time forbidden him to go, he determined to set out at once and, if possible, overtake the ambassadors. Would you agree this is just a little different than the picture that is being presented in verse 22-21? Yeah, well, it, gets, it gives you more detail. I mean, you can see that it fits. It's just you wouldn't necessarily get that impression. Right. Yeah. 
Accordingly, taking the beast on which he was accustomed to ride, and accompanied by his servants, Balaam began his journey. He feared that even now the divine permission might be withdrawn, and he pressed eagerly forward, hurried, nervous, and impatient, lest he should by some means fail to gain the coveted reward. How little did he in character and appearance resemble a man qualified to execute a divine commission. How little did he in character and in appearance? Are we not in character and appearance to represent Christ to this world at the end of its history? Mm -hmm. And God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. God's anger was kindled against Balaam for his heaven-daring folly. And an angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. The animal, seeing the divine messenger, who was, however, invisible to the master, turned aside from the highway into a field. With cruel blows, Balaam brought the beast back into the path, but again in a narrow place hemmed in by the walls. The angel appeared, and the animal, trying to avoid the menacing figure, crushed the rider's foot against the wall. Had Balaam paused to consider, he would have had sufficient cause to question whether he was not moving contrary to God's will. But he was blinded to the heavenly interposition and knew not that God was obstructing his path. The man became exasperated and beating his animal in a most unmerciful manner, forced it to proceed. Now we note that just the ass saw the angel of the Lord. Did Balaam see the angel of the Lord? No. Did his servants see the angel of the Lord? No. So what, what kind of an example, what kind of a um, a figure can we see here? So, so that's part of the, the, the thing in trying to understand what these symbols are. So we know that we've understood that Balaam is the United States. And, and he doesn't see something, but the ass does. And, and I've made the suggestion that the ass represents the prophecies regarding Islam. Okay. So, so these prophecies see something that Balaam doesn't see, and that is the angel of the Lord. Okay. Uh, just one little note on verse 24 in uh, the King James. When you read it, it says, Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way, but the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards. Um, there's no reason to put the word but there. Uh, you, know, you would just put the word and, which means it's actually a new thought. So this is actually the second one. And so I'm not sure why they put the word but there. Okay. Right. So, I, I, uh, okay. Um, some translations say later the angel of the Lord stood in the path. But, you know, again, that, that's kind of correct. But but wouldn't be correct. Okay. 
That's all I'm saying. Okay. Does it make sense there? And and gives a, an impression that's different. So the R three different times. You might not get that impression if you're reading the King James. I can I can see where you're coming from with that. Yeah. But in this, I think we're also establishing that there are three different mm -hmm. events that are occurring. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's, so it's just Ellen White's correct. And the King James is a bit more obscure on that point. Okay. Because if you were reading it, like if I was just reading this, you know, it says the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. This is verse 23 and his sword drawn in his hand and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into a way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards. Right. So it could just be saying, you know, the angel of the Lord's there in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on one side and a wall on the other side. Um, but, you know, if you read on, I mean, the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall and he smote her again. So you can see by verse 25, it has to be a second event. Yes. But if you just read verse 23 and 24, you wouldn't see that. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Interesting point. And thank you for that. And the angel of the Lord went further. So is this establishing the third point? The third event? Yeah, this is the third one. And stood in a narrow place. So now we have a field. We have a path between two vineyards. And the, the vineyards, are, vineyards are surrounded by walls. And now we stand in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. Here we have another figure. If you cannot turn to the right hand, you are not supportive of a conservative agenda. If you cannot turn to the left, you are not supportive of a liberal agenda. To the right, you are not supporting the Pharisees. To the left, you are not supporting the Sadducees. You can turn neither to the right nor to the left. You must go straight ahead. Well, and we can also make this analogous to the north and the south. Okay. Right hand means south, left hand means north. Whatever so in, in a yeah, right hand is north, left hand is south. So so those could be prophecies regarding the north and the south. Okay. Does that mean that's possible? Which is the king of the north and the king of the south has to do with Republicans and Democrats, is what I'm trying to say as far as the civil war. So well, that, whether, whether we're dealing with the, the war between the states or whether we are dealing with the very uncivil war that is currently occurring, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And, so, and it becomes a Republican Democrat symbol. Okay. Right. So, uh, I mean, that, and that's the thing is we're, we're trying to understand the ass itself. I mean, it could, could represent the Democrats. It could re represent Islam. And it could also represent, what was the third one? Um, oh, um, Issachar, right? Okay. So we, had, so we had three different symbols in scripture that are represented by an ass. And in Issachar, it's, it's, an ass that's um, burdened by, um, well, how's it go again? Yeah, that was um, couching down between two burdens, right? And couching down is, is um, 
basically crouching down on the four legs, just similar to what you see with Balaam's ass when it comes to this third um, uh, event. So, so there might be something there. And, and I suggested that we probably could use all three symbols, depending on which line we're on. But we haven't defined what these lines are yet. And yeah, you know, yeah, one thing we could say about Issachar is this would definitely have to be an internal line. How so? Well, because it's it's dealing with uh, the with Israel. What and um, I already did apply it to an inter internal line, so. Um, but it, it it can be it could still apply, you know, by a, by comparison to other lines as well. So, so let's just say Issachar was an internal line within the movement, uh, the ass being the Democrats being an internal line within the United States, and the ass being Islam being a larger line um, that addresses the world or something like that. I mean, I haven't worked it out or anything, but it is possible. Okay. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. So here's Balaam having a conversation with the ass. What kind of a figure could we present from Balaam's conversation with the ass? So I, Balaam's eyes are not yet open. Mm -hmm. Balaam is not recognizing what's going on, yet he's having a conversation with that which to this time had not spoken okay so let's say this is a prophecy regarding islam okay uh, would there be something regarding the united states addressing this prophecy Well, you know, we're looking at this, that we could have more than one figure represented by the ass, correct? Yeah. Then why can we not have more than one figure represented by Pamela? Well... Do we have other examples where Balaam could represent something else? I mean, the ass, we have three clear... Um, examples in scripture okay well the one isn't particularly in scripture it doesn't say in scripture that an ass represents the democrats but um you know two of them in scripture and one which exists in our history i don't know that we even to make balaam the, balaam the united states would just be the context of the story so maybe if we had uh, the story where the context is different, but I don't know, what would you have Balaam represent beside the United States? 
my question would be, is it possible that Balaam could represent a church because of his prior relationship as a prophet of God? Okay, so, so we know he's a false prophet, which right. represents the United States because it's a Protestant nation. Right. It's it's so I mean, in that sense, it does represent the Protestant church. Because to this point. Um, the Protestants of America would not have a great recognition of the ass as a symbol of Islam. Right. So, I mean, it could be that the Protestants in America then address this prophecy right and, um, and they don't have a sword they don't have the ability to kill those who are presenting this prophecy but they would if they did is that what you're saying that's what i'm saying okay so i mean so th it does still relate to the symbol of the united states but just the protestant side of that right okay So, okay. <clears throat> Again, in a place where there was no passing, the angel appeared as before in an offensive attitude. And the poor beast, trembling with terror, made a full stop and fell to the earth under its rider. Balaam lost all self-control, and his mad rage rose to an extreme height. The dumb beast was now gifted with speech and remonstrated with its frenzied master for his cruel treatment. What have I done to thee that thou shouldst beat me these three times? I'm not seeing something that I'm now seeing, so give me just a moment. So why the the S is now recognizing the fact that Balaam has not been treating it the way it should. Right? Mm -hmm. We have an issue that is occurring. Okay, I, I found it interesting <clears throat> that in the um, in the document that's currently available on the web that the Ellen White Estate does make notations when they make changes in the spelling that is used. And the red star that's put here after frenzied is because apparently Mrs. White in the original publication in the Signs of the Times spelled this P-H-R-E-N-Z-I-E-D instead of the current English F-R-E-N-Z-I-E-D. And when I see something that's, that's spelled with the PH, I mean, my mind goes to different word derivations that could have been used. I didn't recognize that it had that red symbol until just now. So that's, okay. that's my little, you know, stepping off the path for a second. Had Balaam been in possession of his reason, he would have been filled with awe and would have realized that a supernatural power was barring his way. But ungovernable rage had dethroned reason 
and this wonderful miracle was unnoticed. He answered this beast as he would have addressed an intelligent being. Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. Here was a professional magician on his way to pronounce a curse upon a whole people with the intent to paralyze their strength while he had not power even to slay the humble beast on which he rode. Balaam was not in possession of his reason. Balaam had an ungovernable rage. He had chosen not to take control of his emotional state. What does this say for us today? What kind of an example is Balaam showing us here where we need to be very careful today? Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to be an adversary unto thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. What is this saying to us at this time? Here is Balaam. Balaam is now so angry with his ass. He is so angry at Islam that he would, if he'd had a sword, he would have killed the ass. He would then have been on his own two feet, one of which had been crushed. The angel of the Lord has a sword, but because of the forbearance of the ass, because of the wisdom of the ass, recognizing that the Lord is standing in the way, Balaam's life is being spared at this time. Do you think the servants heard the conversation between Balaam and the ass? So, well, we said that they didn't. Okay. Balaam would have heard directly from the Lord. Yeah. So, so, well, yeah. So, so the servants didn't see the angel. I mean, right. the question is, were they? Did they see this conversation? Would they not see, but hear? Or hear it? I don't know. Um. You know, it's a narrow way, so I'm not sure particularly is that like a narrow path on some kind of hill or something where the where the ass couldn't turn around. 
and the only thing it could do was stop. And where were the servants exactly? It doesn't tell us. Right. But I mean, likely the servants would have been behind. Yeah. So how far behind, whether they heard it or not. Right. I don't know. But now as we're being shown. Go ahead. The, it says that she was saved, saved her alive. Right. Now, if you take it the opposite, because he did turn him. She dead? No, I mean, basically, what, what I'm reading here is that, you know, Balaam has now threatened the life of the ass. The angel is saying to Balaam, it's only because of the ass that you're alive. If the ass had not turned away, I would have killed you and left the ass alive. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Yeah, so so um, the ass saved the life of Balaam, <clears throat> what the angel is saying. The ass wasn't in danger. It was only Balaam that was in danger. So in this in this situation, with the application that we're making of figures, that this message, this message of Islam or this message of Issachar is saving Balaam, which we're applying as primarily the United States, and I've, as I've questioned whether this is also possibly Protestant churches. Okay, so we could definitely apply this to July 18th, could we not? I would agree. So, so one of the things about this then, if we, if we look at this figure, yeah. we have a crushing of the foot, which is right. of something that the United States feels. Mm -hmm. But we also have these turnings away. And, you know, if we just, without dealing with all the other problems that it would, would occur, um, but if we took 1993 as a turning way into the field, and if we took 9-11 as a crushing of the foot, then we could take um, the ass speaking to the United States as what happened with the July 18, 2020 prediction. Right. And so what this would show us is that these are predictions that relate to Islam or prophecies that relate to Islam, but they're not the events that we were expecting. At all. Because these are not, these are the angel of the Lord. Um, dealing with prophecies of Islam, preserving the United States. So the warning that was given regarding July 18th, in some ways, has hindered um, or delayed judgments that were going to come upon the United States. And this would fit in the, with the idea that if we had not given that warning to Nashville, the event would have occurred. Right. But that giving of that event is the speaking of the prophecy of Islam that preserves the United States for a time. Right. So, so that's one way we could look at it. Now, that means that's one application of it. But it's an application that fits. I you think said the first one was 93? Yep. Yeah. And what does what happened in '93? Um, there, uh, Islamic terrorists uh, took a rental van and parked it in the parking garage below the the North Tower. I can't remember which 
to each floor of the parking garage. And it took out, I believe, five floors, if I remember correctly. If it had been 30 yards over, it would have, uh, the North Tower would have fallen into the South Tower. And, and this occurred two days before Waco. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so it's, it's already been noted many, many times. And, and it's, it's a symbol that ties to uh, the prophecy of Revelation 9 in sort of a foreshadowing way. It's kind of interesting that that, <clears throat> that had occurred on February 26th of 93. Yeah. So. Their stated, you know, their stated motive was a backlash against American foreign policy and the United States support for Israel. So it is intriguing that when we make this, this application and we tie 93 with 2001, with July 18th, 2020, all of these have the element of Islam. All of these are showing what has gone on in the past, but are being tied to this example that we're, we have been examining the last few days. Here is a lesson to all who have reasoning powers, that harsh treatment, even to the brutes, is offensive to God. Those who profess to love God do not always consider that abuse to animals or suffering brought upon them by neglect is a sin. The fruits of divine grace will be as truly revealed to men, in men by the manner in which they treat their animals as by their service in the house of God. Those who allow themselves to become impatient or enraged with their animals are not Christians. A man who is harsh, severe, and domineering toward the lower animals because he has them in his power is both a coward and a tyrant. And he will, if opportunity offers, manifest the same cruel, overbearing spirit toward his wife and his children. Many do not think that their cruelty will ever be known because the poor dumb beasts cannot reveal it. But could the eyes of these men be opened, as were the eyes of Balaam, they would see an angel of God standing as a witness to testify against them in the courts above. A record goes up to heaven, and a day is coming when judgment will be pronounced against men who make themselves demons by their dealings with God's creatures. If animals could speak, what deeds of horror would be revealed? What tales of suffering because of the perversity of man's temper? How often those creatures of God's care suffer pain, endure hunger and thirst because they cannot make known their wants? And how often is it determined by the mercy of or the caprice of man, whether they receive attention and kindness or neglect and abuse. Punishment is punishment given in passion to an animal is frequently excessive and is then absolute cruelty. Animals have a kind of dignity and self-respect akin to that possessed by human beings. If abused under the influence of blind passion, their spirits will be crushed and they will become nervous, irritable, and ungovernable. All disposition to cause pain to our fellow man or to the brute creation is satanic. Balaam evidenced the spirit which he possessed in his course toward his beast. Now, 
And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it be evil in thine eyes, I will get me back again. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. When so, he, go ahead. Uh, if, if they understand now where, are they going to understand that the message was true? You mean the princes of Balak? Balaam. Well, Balaam did it to themselves. <laughs> I don't know. Like the message of the July. Will it open up to them? Will it be open? Are you asking if the Protestants would understand the message of July 18th? Yes. Okay. I think to understand the message of July 18th, they're going to have to have an understanding of the prophecies regarding Islam. And in many ways, I don't know that yet this moment that many understand outside of this group the importance of the message of July 18th. I mean, we're, as we're addressing this today, how many in the past would have applied the falling down of the ass before the angel of the Lord to have been the message of July 18th? Like this is a revelation because the way that this has been being interpreted recently places the crushing of the foot and the falling down of the ass as being economic destruction upon the United States rather than looking at this as being the message of the prophecies coming against the United States. And, and it seems to make more sense, actually. I, I don't think it seems to. I think it does make more sense. Okay. Yeah. Well, it still seems to in the sense that it, it looks like it makes more sense. Um, so, so if we take this as 1993, 9-11, and July 18, 2020, um, and this helps us distinguish why Balaam is riding the ass. Now, we still could make the other application. That is, it, it can represent uh, the United States being supported by Islamic oil. But, but it's still a little bit different than what we had with what Jeff had said. I mean, because Jeff had these three strikes starting at 9-11. And um, so, I mean, st we're still going to have to sort out what that means. Now, in the studies that you've been watching that Jeff presented, yeah. now, are they specifically studies dealing with going through this prophecy at all? Are there any that he goes through step by step? 
or is he, he just referring to it? He, he gives reference to them. I have yet to see them where he studied them step by step. I have received an email with notes from a party that were at the Portola meetings. Okay. But I have not had the time yet to go through those notes. Yeah. You know, because the question I have is, did he actually originate this interpretation? Or is he sharing something that someone else shared first? Well, one of the issues that I've run into is that that the notes from the presentations he gave at Lambert Church were not linked as they posted those sermons. And I don't have a way of obtaining those notes from seven years ago. Yeah, I mean, they might have been linked at one point, but. So I'm when I'm, I've gone through these presentations, I've had to go through them listening as carefully as possible, but my initial purpose was to look at the chart as he was laying it out to get an idea as to, to where he was trying to line up waymarks. Right. Now, it's not that I'm going to disagree with Elder Jeff, but in this situation, the light has continued to advance, especially as we are looking at the light in the relationship of these situations being messages so that we could then address what message or what prophetic implications are there from these examples that we're seeing. There are many in the world today whose character is represented by that of Balaam. They have a correct knowledge of most of the doctrines of religions, but with these are mingled superstitions and heresies. Satan has a knowledge of the truth, and so do many who are his servants. Excellent words may proceed from their lips. They may claim to possess great faith and to enjoy much of the divine blessing but their hearts are destitute of the grace of God. They are not followers of Christ and do not those things that please him. The only safety for any at the present day, as well as in ancient times, is to seek diligently to know the will of God and then be ready to obey that will. Those who profess to be the servants of the living God, frequently unite themselves with ungodly men, expecting to be promoted to honor and to be rewarded with riches. And many sacrifice conscience, judgment, character, and the favor of God to form an alliance with worldlings. Such persons call God their master, but they refuse to keep his commandments. They mistake gain for godliness, and unless they turn from their evil ways, they must perish with the workers of iniquity. Notice that many sacrifice conscience, followed by judgment, combined with character, under the favor of God. Could this also not be an example of sacrificing the messages of the three angels of Revelation 14 and the other angel of Revelation 18? 
Okay, say that uh, question again. Okay. We have here that there are many that sacrifice conscience, judgment, character, and the favor of God. Could we make the application that when one chooses to sacrifice conscience, that you are, sac you are turning away from the message of the first angel of Revelation 14? When you sacrifice judgment, the under your understanding of your own judgment that you are choosing to abandon the second angel's message yeah well definitely if you have all of these things mm -hmm. um if you're sacrificing conscience judgment character in the favor of god to form an alliance with worldlings i mean that is what happened after the rejection of, of the first angel's message I mean, the Protestants, in rejecting fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Um, they took a stand with the world, really, in that point. Right. So. Okay. And, and, and one of the things about that, too, I mean, I think one of the reasons the Protestants rejected um miller's message is because it made them look foolish that is the world was mocking it and and many people didn't want to be associated with something that was unpopular you know with the popular press right so i mean this is a principle we see in adventism quite a bit This is something that we have seen exhibited within the Adventist church since 1863. We don't want to accept the message of the 2520 because that points us as being part of the folly of William Miller. We don't want to accept or present the message of the 2300 days. Because again, this is what is pointed by William Miller. We don't want the investigative judgment. We are setting it aside because we don't want to be seen as a cult. <laughs> Yeah, within scholarship, I mean, it's wanting to be accepted as an equal among all the other scholars. Right. And, and, and you see this quite clearly in the types of things that are said, the style of writing in scholarly papers and so forth. Um, it's, 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 it's looking for acceptance, or at least to try to make Adventists' views look more acceptable, look as modern scholarship and that means you don't have very firm conclusions you leave things very open you present alternate views and and you just kind of i mean in some ways it, it it's it can be used to an effective way to witness but that's not really the purpose of it the purpose is more to to find a place and of course compromises then become uh are made again and again to be accepted as an Adventist scholar. So you don't even accept what Adventism teaches in the, in the, the guise of objectivity. Exactly. And when Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him unto a city of Moab, which is in the border of Ammon, which is in the utmost coast. And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto thee to call thee? 
Wherefore camest thou not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote thee to honor? And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Am I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. When he was informed of the approach of Balaam, the king of Moab went out with a large retinue to the borders of his kingdom to welcome the prophet and to show him special honor. After the first salutations had been exchanged, the monarch expressed his astonishment at Balaam's delay in the view of the great riches and honor awaiting him. The answer was, lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that I shall speak. Balaam greatly regretted this restriction. He feared that his purpose could not be carried out because the Lord's controlling power was upon him. Here's Balaam. I represent God, but he may not let me do what I need to do in order to receive that which I desire so greatly. So is Balaam as a Protestant going to give that message of July 18th. I don't think so. I think the message of July 18th has already been given. It has been given to the world. The world has chosen to mock it just as the world currently mocks the seventh day Sabbath. But when the destruction comes upon Nashville, as we know that it will, because this was a prediction that was given by Mrs. White, when this falls upon the world, there will be those that recognize that, yes, we did say that destruction was coming. And those that will be living there are going to say, why didn't you warn me? Am I not your neighbor? <clears throat> the Protestants will recognize that this was a valid message. that God truly is in control. But when they begin to recognize that this was a, a true message, I think they're more going to take the track and the tack that they have not been praying to God to restore the prosperity that they so greatly desire. They like Balaam will have, will see that they are voicing sentiments that may be partially of God, but they will not view them properly because they will not be seeing that they are also partially that of the adversary. That's an opinion, okay? And Balaam went with Balak, and they came unto Kirjath Huzoth, a city of streets. 
Why is it important here that we note that Balaam and Balak came on to Kerjath Huzath, the city of streets? Hmm. Is there a representation that we have of a city of streets? Is this a symbol of something? I'm not aware of it. Okay. Maybe I'm just forgetting something. And Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. Who offered the oxen and sheep? Balak did. Not Balaam. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So... Kerjath Puzoth, a city of streets. Mrs. White says it this way. <clears throat> With great display, Balak now escorted his guests to the capital, where a public entertainment was to take place, and special offerings were to be made to secure the favor of their gods. A sumptuous feast had been prepared. And all the wealth and power Moab could do had been done to render their idolatrous services grand and imposing with the express object of impressing the prophet with the superiority of their religion over any other. Here this professed servant of the living God was seated with a company of idolaters at a feast given in honor to, of their deities. This wicked prophet was indeed selling himself for reward. Specifically, is there anything here that Balaam was doing that had been forbidden at that point in time. While he's eating food sacrificed to idols, I would guess. Right. And involved in he's taking part. Or a theater is taking part in an idolatrous feast. This reminds me of Belshazzar. See, the Moabites know now they have been snared. Him. Okay. Theodore, you had a, a, a finishing comment? No. Okay. So here, Mrs. White is identifying Balaam as rather than a true prophet, as a wicked prophet. In this case, we have an illustration of the great blindness which will come upon the minds of those who sacrifice their eternal interests to the love of gain. Balaam's character had been tested and tried and was found to be dross. The fine gold of principle and steadfast integrity was gone, and the base metal alone appeared. Had Balaam been blind to that of the agent, or of the angel, excuse me. Was 
Balaam blind to the angel as he rode upon his ass. Yep. Is Balaam being said to be blind as he is dining with these idolaters? Affirmative. So, in other words, here we have a man whose eyes had been opened. He was being shown God's control in all that he is doing, and yet he's willingly returning to blindness. What else can we say here? Um, this is what greed and the love of the world do. I mean, you throw out the first, second, and third, third angel's messages. You throw out all our foundations, basically, because I've seen it happening. And you're worse than a worldly because you had the truth and you rejected it. And you let one of your besetting sins, one of your most evil traits take control of you. This is a real stern warning. If men who profess to be the children of God ignominiously yield to the tempter, if they seek the honor which the world proffers them rather than the honor which comes from above, their boasted power and wisdom will prove to be but weakness and folly. They will reap a harvest of agony and despair. But if those who bear the name of God's servants yield obedience to his will and boldly confront the powers of darkness, having no harmony or union with the Lord's avowed enemies, although opposition may come fierce and strong, although great financial loss may be sustained, they, like the faithful and true prophets of old, will triumph finally. So, if we are going to profess to be children of God, we cannot honor that which the world offers us. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up unto the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. Balak is now taking Balaam to the high places of Baal. As it says in Deuteronomy 12, 2, ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess served their gods, upon the high mountains, upon the hills, and under every green tree. The admonition given by Moses that you are to destroy these high places is no different for us today. Many of the high places that we see today are these which are worshiping idols. They may be called icons by others but they are nothing but idols. This supposed Green New Deal is nothing more than the worship of the creation rather than the creator. So many other things that we can point to that give no glory to God are today being reverenced. Here is our situation. We are to be separate. 
Yet Balaam in this situation was taken by Balaam to the high places of Baal. Satan took Christ to the spire of the temple and offered him all the kingdoms and glory of this world if Christ would compromise and worship him. Okay. The feast ended. The king with all his honorable men escorted Balaam to the high places of Baal where he could overlook the immense assemblage of the Hebrews scattered upon the plain of Shechem and the tableland above. Behold the prophet as he stands upon the lofty height, looking down over the encampments of God's chosen people. How little do Israel know of what is transpiring so near them? How little do they know of the care of God extended over them by day and by night. How dull are the perceptions of God's people. How slow are they in every age to comprehend his great mercy and care. While all the powers of earth and hell are combined to destroy, God guards his children still. The Lord would not have his people in continual fear. Hence, he does not reveal to them a thousandth part of the efforts of their great adversary to allure and destroy. If they could discern the wonderful power of God constantly exerted in their behalf, would not their hearts be filled with gratitude for his love? and with awe at the thought of his majesty and wondrous power. There upon the mountaintop are the emissaries of Satan devising evil against God's people who are all unconscious to their danger. But he that keepeth Israel does not slumber. The Lord's eye discerns every plot against his own, and no weapon formed against his church shall prosper. God restrains the power of wicked men. He says to them, thus far shalt thou go, and no farther. What a thought is this. What a theme for contemplation. And what a response of love and faithfulness should it call forth from every child of God. All of us are being tried and tested. All of us are being presented with straits and difficulties. In this, no one is alone. What are we to do in all things? What is it that Paul says to us? We are to do in all things. Thanks. Are we not to praise him? We don't know the many blessings that he has given us. We see a few. We need to recognize his loving kindness, and his care in everything that goes on. Now, we'll share a few things for what we're going to begin studying for tomorrow and for the next couple of days. And then we will be close to the end of our time today.
In Numbers 23, as the translators would see this, we will first deal with Balak's sacrifice. By verse 7, we will deal with Balaam's first parable. In the 14th, Balak is going to sacrifice again. Verse 18, Balaam is going to give a second parable. By verse 25, Balak is displeased with Balaam and bringeth him to the top of Peor and sacrifices there. <clears throat> the modern translations would call from verse one on Balaam's first oracle. But we're going to look at these six verses. We're going to examine what we can in the time we have remaining. And Balaam said unto Balak, build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. What was the presentation that Mrs. White and scripture gave us in the preceding verses of the preceding chapter? Where are they doing this sacrifice? In the high places? In the high places of what? The high places of Baal. Baal worship. Okay. Here is Balaam. Here is Balak in the high places of Baal. Balaam has an understanding of the type of sacrifices that the children of Israel are to have. But these standing here where there are idolatrous symbols all around him, and he wants seven altars on which they're going to sacrifice seven oxen and seven rams as if this is going to be pleasing unto God. <clears throat> so what you have is you have them offering in chapter 22, or at least Balak offers oxen and sheep upon the high places of Baal, right? In chapter 22, the last two verses. Okay. Um, so then it doesn't say anything there about seven altars, seven oxen, or seven rams, right? I'm agreeing. Okay. But in chapter 23 now, Balak and Balaam are going to offer upon seven altars, seven oxen, and seven rams. Sometimes says... Uh, um, uh, uh, bullock, but uh, anyway, so it's it's not a bullock. It, it's an it's an oxen or a bullock, right? It says oxen in one place and a bullock in the other, but it's the same word. Okay, so so it doesn't really say in chapter twenty two, um, and and I would assume that this is a different offering. So Balak is going to offer upon these high places of Baal. And then Balaam and Balak are going to offer upon these seven altars that are then going to be made at Balaam's request. Is that what happens? Well, what I'm saying, what, what I'm looking at here, if the translators are correct, Balaam will give the instruction. Mm -hmm. And Balak will do the offering. Okay, in verse two. Yeah. What did they say? What did the translators say about verse two? Well, in ter in first verse yeah. one, they call it Balak's sacrifice. Okay. Because in verse 2, 2, 3, 2, 
And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. Yeah, so to me, it seems like both of them are offering. Now, uh, both, yeah. okay, if both of them are offering, then is Balaam joined with the idolatrous king? Yes. So, so, um, um, so I'm trying to understand what's happening here. So in chapter 22, Balak makes some offerings. It's not upon seven altars or seven, and it's it's not. It's just he's going to offer oxen and sheep. Right. right. Correct. So, um, and then and then in chapter 22, now Balaam is going to make a request for these seven altars. In in chapter 23. I mean, chapter 23. Yeah. So in chapter 23, he's going to make this in verse uh, one, uh, seven altars, seven oxen, seven rams. We're going to have this, these seven altars being repeated throughout this chapter. Right. So even though it only mentions it twice, that there's going to be these seven altars with seven oxen and seven rams. Um, the idea is that each time they do this, they're going to build seven altars and offer seven oxen and seven rams or seven bullocks and seven rams. Right. Um, so my, my suggestion is that this 777 relates to the periods of 777 days. Okay. I don't see a reason to disagree. Yeah. Now in verse three, and Balaam said unto Balak, stand by thy burnt offering and I will go. Peradventure the Lord will come to meet me and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to an high place. And God met Balaam and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, unto Balak, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice he and all the princes of Moab. <clears throat> so here we have Balaam now receiving a word and he returned to Balak. He returns to Balak where Balak has been doing this sacrifice himself in front of all the princes of Moab. So. Yeah, so, um, so in verse 4, where God met Balaam, right? And he said unto him, I've prepared seven altars. This is, of course, Balaam speaking. I've offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And then the Lord puts in Balaam's mouth uh, and said, Return unto Balak, thus shalt thou speak. And he returned unto him, lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice. He and all the princes of Moab would be Balak, the he there. Right. And then he took up his parable. This is going to be Balaam. And said, Balak, the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram, or Syria, out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, come defy Israel. So he's going to then give his first oracle. So, so they, they offer, they build these altars. They offer upon them seven bullocks, seven rams, on each of the seven altars. So that means there's, well, there's, one ram, I guess, for one altar, one one bullock for one altar. And and then Balaam, after they offer, he's going to go 
and get a message from God. And he comes back and Balak is there standing beside uh, his altar. Right. Right. And then he's going to give this oracle. So yeah, I'm trying to figure this out. I know nobody knows what I'm thinking. Um, but what's important is uh, chapter 22 is important um, with what Balak does. But now we're going to have these four times they're going to build seven altars. And, and each of these oracles then must have some kind of fulfillment if we're going to apply it to our history. And there's going to be four oracles. There's three plus one. Yeah. There's also four periods of 777 days from December 21st, 2012 to December uh, uh, 25th, 2021. So four periods of 777 days. And if there's four offerings of on seven altars, seven bullock and seven ram, that could relate to those four periods. It's just, just a thought. Okay. Now. In the chat, it's also being suggested four times, four generations. Well, the number four is always referring to four generations. Okay. In some way. So, <clears throat> and it's a three one combination. Just like the messages of Revelation 14 and the message of Revelation 18. Right. So, yeah. So, those always will align. Okay. And so it has to relate to that. So, and that still does, even if we relate it to the seven, seven, seven periods. Right. 777 day periods. Now, we are now at the close of our time together today. Are there any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, I was just wondering if this has any value or if the oxen, the symbols of Ephraim, the end status of corrupt Protestantism and the rams of Medo-Persia, in the U.S. in its final throws, also sanctuary beasts represented, and I put this as a desecration. So those are the thoughts that came to me too. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, is there anything else? Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to closely examine this example. Help us as we give consideration to that which we have been reading. Direct us now, be with us, please. Show us that that you would have us to learn. May that which we do today bring glory to your name and to your character. Help us that we may be willing witnesses to all of that that you would have us to understand. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the participation. We thank you for the comments. And we pray, Father, for your blessing throughout this day in all that we do. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.